Canari, I'm the director here. Um, and we're very excited today to be hosting the inaugural edition of the Multitude Discourse Series, uh, the sort of academic discursive component of the Multitude Art Prize, uh, which is, as we know, co-presented by the Multitude Foundation and Wuhan Art Terminus. Actually, same work. Okay. Um, our lovely co-presenters, and we are the institutional partner this year. So it's it's amazing to be able, as UCCA, to welcome uh, such a distinguished group of scholars and curators to um, visit us here. Um, of course, this group is organized by L'Internationale, which is a collective of European museums, which I'm sure we'll be hearing more about as the day goes on. Um, and the goal of today's proceedings and the format is really to provide opportunities for uh, some frank and hopefully rather informal conversations about issues facing us all. Um, on that note, I'm going to pass the microphone to Colin, who will um, sort of set the stage in a, in a more direct way. And um, turn your cell phones off and all of that, or make them silent, and uh, sometimes it messes up with the simultaneous interpretation system. So be mindful of our Chinese colleagues who are listening to today's proceedings, which are mostly in English over uh, their earphones through the courtesy of our uh, wonderful simultaneous interpreters. Colin. So welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Colin Chinnery. I'm the uh, director of the Multitude Art Prize and artistic director of the Wuhan Art Terminus, What. Um, now, as Phil Canary just said, um, we're very honored to have such a distinguished group of people with us today to um, share their thoughts with us. Um, and I'd like to just give a little bit of background to um, this particular conference and this project, set the stage, set the context, talk context for what we're going to be talking about. Um, so if, I, if I'm talking slightly, if I'm talking slightly slowly, it's because I want the Chinese, uh, the, our Chinese listeners, to be able to follow the, 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 the simultaneous translation. So again, as Phil just said, when we're having our conversations, I think that would be mindful that it's being translated. Um, so the project itself, the Multitude Art Prize, is um, grounded in the desire to create more and sustained conversations between different regions of Asia. Um, China, for example, this is the stage in which we're on, um, is, uh, has certain issues that many curators that we discuss with artists all the time. And one of those issues is the situation of the kind of incestuousness of the market. And this has given rise to all kinds of problems, not only on the commercial side, but also on the artistic side. Now, one of the issues that I feel that, um, that it suffers from is that it's lack of conversation with the outside world. Now, the art market can, can somehow resolve this to some extent through art fairs, um, but in most places in Asia, and China is no exception, uh, the secondary market is far stronger than the primary market as a driving force for the market and prices of artworks. And this sets a kind of stage in which a younger, gener younger generation of artists sees the art world. So you need a counterbalance to the strength of the market. And that counterbalance, of course, is institutions like UCCA. The counterbalance is projects of international artists and biennials. But together with this also um, is the conversations and the links that are not just biannuals, or, but is actually something constant that we create the conversation with other people and then that creates a network that creates conversations with other people and then that creates more projects that then keep on going. And um, so this was a kind of background to why we thought about doing something that creates conversations. And in conversation with other curators in different parts of Asia, um, other curators felt that other Asian regions, maybe not to the same extent as China, but suffer from some of the same issues. That because of Asia is not like Europe or the States, it's not one coherent landmass. It's one coherent landmass, it's not one coherent culture. 
it, each region has got its own cultural and historical roots, and because of that, each region has its own interpretation of contemporary. And each region finds it much more, it's much easier to have a conversation amongst themselves than to go to other alien, more alien cultures, such as those of their Asian colleagues. So to th think of a way, a method of creating a sustained conversation between different regions of Asia seemed to be an idea that many people kind of it got good feedback from different people, regardless of whether they're Asian curators or artists or, or, those, in, or those in the West. So that's basically the stage. So the, the art prize is a manifestation of the actual um, artwork through the process of, process of selection. And the conversations that we have, we want to create an annual series of lectures, of conversations, that follow the art prize. Now, one of the most important things is that this project doesn't stay in one place. Asia is such a lar large place that this project, in order to have conversations about Asia, needs to follow, needs to be in different Asian contexts in order to create those conversations between the different contexts. So this year is in China, it's the first year. The next year will be in West Asia. And then each year following that will be in different parts of Asia. So, um, one of the, um, the, 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 the beginnings of this project was um, a conversation that I had with curators in Europe um, from the museum network Lancia Nationale. And um, the Lancia Nationale is a museum network that uh, consists of some of the most important modern and contemporary art museums throughout Europe. And the, the feedback I got from them was that the conversations that we have is the, the, the multitude art prize and discourse series ideas kind of reflect the institutional network ideas that Lancia Nationale also represent. We'll be hearing about that in more detail later on in the afternoon. But that was, in a way, a catalyst for the conversations that we're having this year, because Lancia Nationale became the Multitude Art Prize discourse partner for 2013, our inaugural edition. And from that, from that, that kind of context, I started to have conversations with curator, with curator friends about who to invite all the people for, to, to invite throughout Asia. So we have a, a very wide mix of curators from both Europe, but also, very importantly, almost most importantly, from around Asia, um, that I thought would have a series of different kinds of, um, would keep the perspectives fresh and changing, but focused on two particular things in this inaugural edition. Because this is our first edition of the conference, um, we wanted to kind of set the tone for the project and the series of conversations that we want to have on an annual basis. So one of the things that we want to articulate, or let's say, talk about and discuss, is, the, is this phrase multitude. Not necessarily in the terms that Hart and Negri state in their books, but more in relation to artistic practice and how that artistic practice is relevant in different contexts. Because multitude, as a context, as a concept, it articulates the idea of potentiality in different contexts, regardless of social background or cultural background. And artists, in a way, are such a multitude. So, how do artists from different contexts, contexts in different parts of Asia, who are going through massive geopolitical change, the context of China, the context of West Asia, so incredibly different, how do artists face that kind of environment and create some kind of relevance through their art? Is relevance important? Is, is a connection to society important? All these issues, I think, are related to the idea of multitude. So that's one idea, and we're going to discuss this from two perspectives in the morning. One is thinking about artists and artworks in related to the idea of multitude. And in the afternoon, we think more about institutions and relations between institutions. As we can think of institutions as a whole as a kind of multitude.
It's not only individuals that you can think as a group that creates change. Institutions can be each seen as an individual who come together, who can also create change. So in the afternoon, it's, in the morning, it's talking about um, multitude, first from the perspective of artists, and secondly from the perspective of between the relationship between institutions and their audience. In the afternoon, we'll talk, be talking about Lancha Nationale, first of all, and secondly, we'll be talking about um, relationships between different Asian institutions. So, um, now I think I've given a little bit of background on it, and I don't want to start rambling. Well, I've already rambled. I'll stop rambling um, and introduce our first panel. Um, our first panel is, um, our moderator is Kate Powell, who will be in conversation with the Multitude Art Prize jury. And this is um, very centrally on what the idea of what I just said is how art can be relevant or why art should be relevant and how it expresses, how this kind of relevance expresses itself as potentiality in different kinds of contexts, in different cultural contexts, social contexts. Um, so I'll give an introduction to each of our um, panelists. First of all, uh, Kate Powell is Chief Curator of the Garage of the Centre of Co um, Contemporary Culture in Moscow and Director at Large of ICI, Independent Co uh, Curators International in New York. And Kate is also one of our Multitude Art Prize partner curators. Next is uh, Zdenka Bedovinac, who is Director of the Moderna Galleria in Ljubljana. November Painter, Associate Director of Research and Programs at SALT in Istanbul. Jack Persekian is director at the Alma Mal Foundation in Jerusalem and also director and head curator of the Palestinian Museum that's opening next year. Patrick Flores, professor of art studies at the Department of Art Studies at the University of the Philippines and curator of the Vargas Museum in Manila and adjunct curator at the National Art Gallery in Singapore. And Ravi Sundaram, co-founder of Sarai, in New Delhi. So these are, um, Kate is our partner curator, and the other curators I mentioned are members of the jury. So may I welcome them to the stage. Please give them a hand. So, uh, thank you, Colin, for setting the stage so that this, um, this first panel can have some kind of platform from which to take off from. Um, I have to say it's a, um, a real pleasure to be a part curator of this, and it's been great working with you, um, trying to think through this whole idea of how to create a network and an ongoing conversation. So, the question that we have been charged with uh, thinking through is what does it mean for art to be relevant and how does relevance relate to potential in different geopolitical contexts? That's rather large. So I decided that to try and kind of frame this, this question so that the panelists have an opportunity to kind of put some concrete ideas on the table. Um, I would turn to the actual definition or the, the kind of the subject of the conference as a whole. So this, this, whole, um, this or the whole day is about approaches to art and multitude in Asia. So let's think about relevance in relation to art and multitude in Asia and see where we get to with that or what relevance can mean. So I thought that I would... Um, very quickly describe what Asia is, what multitude is, and what art is, which could actually be a lifetime's achievement. So excuse me for gross um, generalizations. 
So the Multitude Foundation at the moment has decided that to describe Asia, there are five regions and it's those, so there are five artists or artist collectives that have been selected for the prize. And those regions are South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia and Greater China. So that's one way we could think about Asia in terms of... Um, it's also, this is kind of thinking about it as a landmass and as a continent. So it is the largest and most densely populated continent in the world. There are, it's around 60% of the world's population that lives in Asia. According to Wikipedia, um, there are apparently more than 600 languages spoken in Indonesia, 800 in India, and 100 in the Philippines. So if we just take that as a basic premise, what is Asia becomes, um, I mean, we can see the enormity of the issue that we're dealing with. Um, so we have to recognize the fact that in the context that we're talking, really Asia is a cultural concept more than anything that we can make concrete. Um, one thing that I think that um, people working in Asia or with the kind of concept of Asia have in common is that um, contemporary art is not part of, um, it doesn't kind of come out of, it doesn't, it's not rooted in traditional culture. Contemporary art comes very much out of um, a kind of engagement with um, the everyday, engagement with physical, social and cultural surroundings. And so that's, that's one way we can say that there is a kind of commonality, that people are not using the kind of roots of traditional culture necessarily to kind of frame contemporary art. Um, and you could say that this is relevance in itself. Um, a common problem is this language divide. And I don't just mean not being able to speak the same language. I think that there's a problem with um, the language of contemporary art in relation to the language of like everyday kind of talking because the language of contemporary art often has been kind of appropriated or shift it so that it doesn't make sense necessarily. So that's Asia covered. <laughs> so just thinking about multitude, one of the um, one of the kind of good things and bad things about the concept of multitude is that there isn't a fixed definition. Um, there's many kind of shifting parameters around the concept, but just to try and get a couple of thoughts out there about multitudes so we can talk about relevance, is that um, the, the concept of multitude is to do with the whole of singularities, rather than, kind of, rather than so it's a resistance to um, homogenization. And in particular, now, I think multitude has become uh, relevant and popular because of the fact that it's, thinking through a resistance to um, globalization or the, the kind of capitalist globalized systems that we're kind of faced with no matter where we are. So if we have some words, let's say three words in relation to multitude for thinking about relevance. The concept of multitude is um, unmediated. It's about unmediation. It's um, about imminence or being imminent, which is, I think, this kind of constant potential that Colin was talking about. And um, it's also about kind of um, informal networks or things that are not necessarily direct, kind of downward direction. So um, kind of putting art on the table and thinking about art in relation to what relevance can mean, I'm, it, far too large, but in the premise of this award, um, what it, the way that the Multitude Foundation has described it is that art and artists are not um, supposed to, nobody believes that art or artists are supposed to represent a culture or represent a region. However, there is a um, strong kind of point that um, art practice does have some kind of relationship or um, connection to the context in which it's produced. And so while artists may not represent a region, um, there's an argument to say that art is produced because of a place that it's, you know, that you're working in or social and political contexts. 
So based on this, if we think about um, trying to describe, or trying, trying to say what relevance actually means, what's the point of talking about relevance? This is the frame, it's like the, the kind of enormity of Asia. Um, how do we, and the enormity of what art can be, it's like how, how art can have a kind of relationship to context. Um, how do we determine what relevance is? Is it relevance to context? Is it relevance to a broader dialogue? that may be outside of art as well? Is it relevant to the development of infrastructure and like different art worlds? Is it relevant to audience, and if so, which audiences? Or is it just relevant to the person here as the jury? Is it just relevant to you and the way that you think about art? Does that make any sense at all? So within, within this context, the, the question that you've been kind of asked to to deal with is what does it mean for art to be relevant? So perhaps if each of you could speak for five minutes, um, saying what you, on a, on a personal basis, a concrete example of what you think it means for art to be relevant, and then we'll go on and talk about how relevance relates to potential. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I would, I would, um, like to talk about the relevance from my own uh, perspective, uh, being a director of the uh, main institution in Slovenia, uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, I've been working a lot on the uh, relevance, which I have been describing in terms of urgencies. Uh, first, uh, coming from the um, problematics of the museum um, of, of the museum model so should the museum uh, follow kind of uh, universal model or the museum should be something uh, more related to the singular models and second from the perspective of the um, uh, historicization of Eastern European art and I think this Two, two issues uh, are uh, similar, probably, uh, at least as uh, I learned from the, being the jury member here for the Matitus uh, Prize Award. Um, so I recognized many artists from Asia uh, deal at the moment um, with the similar problematics as Eastern European artists which is probably the result of the, um, I would say, the lack of historicization, at least uh, the specific um, histories, specific traditions. In Eastern Europe, that would be the tradition of um, uh, post-war avant-garde. Uh, I would not... Uh, there to to talk about uh, uh, Asia tradition, I can just um, I recognize the problem in very uh, general terms. Um, so the the second uh, thing would be um, in Eastern Europe the lack of infrastructure, and probably I can um, uh, I suppose uh, something similar uh, goes also for Asia. So these are two uh, very important elements um, that uh, form, the, form the ground for the reflection of the idea of the relevance. So the, for us in Eastern Europe, the question of delay was always uh, a big issue. So we were always self-critical and also criticized from the outside being delayed. So probably this is also something that um, professionals and artists uh, from Asia uh, can deal with. Uh, I mean, um, are familiar with. Uh, so the 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 question was, of course, how to how to approach this problem of delay, and the answer has been, um, you know, to become concurrent, to become kind of timely. With, uh, let's say we, we always have compared uh, ourselves, of course, with the West in terms of time, in terms of styles, in terms of models, and so on. So um, the answer today, I would say, 
uh, is when the museum or the artist um, deal with uh, the, the urgencies of its own context, uh, this can be the right way to become, you know, uh, just concurrent with uh, its own time, timely, I don't know what would be the right timeliness. <laughs> The right. Um, so this this can be the uh, the the potential way how to how to solve this big trauma. And the 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 question of the museum model um, is like in the same frame of uh, of thinking. So how you as a museum um, can deal with the question of delay the question of um, lack of uh, historicization, the lack of infrastructure. So this, th these are the three questions that I've tried to answer through last 15 years from my own experience experiences. So I learned a lot from the artist and uh, talking about the historicization, there is something I again, through my work in the jury, recognize a similarity between East, um, Eastern Europe and Asia. And um, this is a phenomenon related to the um, historicization from the artistic um, side, from the artist side. So there are in Eastern Europe, for example, many artists uh, who try to follow their own uh, local traditions through their own work. And I coined special terms for it, uh, which is self-historicization. So it would mean that um, an artist uh, follows the local tradition that is very relevant for his or her, her own work. Uh, because the artist always needs um, the the contextualization for his or her own um, own uh, artistic production. So there are many artists in Eastern Europe who have been doing uh, work with the uh, archives, who have been uh, uh, relating to the um, older uh, artists from the same line, from the same tradition, and so on. So uh, I would uh, mention that in 2000 we built a first Eastern European uh, collection and when I started to learn about Eastern European art it was, I, it was the moment that I uh, uh, approached the artists, exactly this uh, type of artists um, who were in the practice of self-historicization. And today I would name this uh, production in the same terminology, with the help of the same terminology as you are using. So it created kind of multitude. And I would also say it created kind of alternative cultural production, which is also for me very, very important, um, a very important term, also for the L'Internationale. Uh, when we, but we are talking about in in the afternoon. So it's um, it's um, something that really comes from my own experience. So it's an interesting moment also of uh, potentiality. How you uh, as an institution collaborate with the partners who are not at the, uh, of the same status. So this I name as a kind of uh, uh, horizontal collaboration, uh, which is a must, at least in certain, uh, in certain regions, uh, a kind of priority, kind of relevance. Um, so it goes the same for the institutions and the same for the artists. So this uh, issue of uh, collaboration uh, on a horizontal way, uh, I would define as one of the uh, relevant uh, for the institution and for the artist. And this is the way how uh, the both sides, let's say, 
approach the reality, approach the context, and uh, with a fluid, uh, how it can help developing uh, the infrastructure, which I uh, named uh, before as one of the crucial problems uh, still in Eastern Europe. So there is no art market yet, luckily or not, I don't know. So there are institutions, but still underdeveloped. But there are ideas of alternative cultural production. And I think this is something uh, promising. Maybe this is enough? Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, maybe the issue of uh, relevance, uh, which leads to potentiality, um, needs to be viewed at least from that corner of the of Asia where I come from, uh, from a historical perspective. Um, I think the two issues that artists and eventually what I'm will try to lead in, in my argument to art institutions or the art infrastructure have been. Um, uh, historically controlled by uh, first the governments and the authorities uh, and who have uh, basically sub uh, um, col controlled the practice and controlled the outcomes uh, in one way or another uh, and lately in the last uh, decade or so uh, the art market uh, that uh, is uh, basically exerting uh, a lot of pressure and influence on, 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 the, on the art practice. Um, maybe starting from a specific case in Palestine where historically, and not looking at particularly art, uh, but looking at uh, empowering, I mean, uh, again, if I'm thinking about the role of, of art uh, as a, an agent uh, of empowerment and mobilization, uh, I think historically in the case of Palestine uh, uh, and due to occupation, uh, society, it's, uh, society had taken uh, uh, control of its destiny through organizing itself and through creating the systems and the uh, structure to um, basically um, care for, for the community through uh, um, all sorts of uh, grassroots organizations that tended to health, to education, and to culture. Uh, that particular model in Palestine uh, um, was not uh, possible in other places in the Arab world uh, due to the, of course, uh, uh, existence of autocratic uh, regimes who would not allow for anything that is uh, outside the government infrastructure to operate. Hence, uh, artistic production in general uh, was up to uh, a, um, a big, uh, uh, to a large extent, uh, uh, under the mercy of whatever uh, possibilities uh, these uh, governmental systems would allow. Uh, now moving to what contemporary art has brought, and I, I really appreciate your de definition of what contemporary art and how it basically takes from, from social context, the uh, cultural context, the, um, uh, even the economic context, and, and tries to draw from it inspiration and engagement with society. Uh, what contemporary art started doing in, in different places in the other world was to basically uh, find ways to connect with society outside uh, the circles of the government uh, uh, formats and the uh, government sanctioned uh, institutions. Um, and artists uh, started gradually to uh, um, come together and create uh, uh, ad hoc, uh, um, uh, ad hoc uh, groups and eventually um, institutions uh, that catered to their needs and uh, uh, basically laid down 
the mechanisms through which they could reach out to to the to the community and through that reach out to uh, to the to to to, the, to an audience beyond their uh, basically uh, geography. Um, the 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 problem that I also mentioned at the beginning is the uh, kind of the coming in of the of the market that somehow is trying. Uh, to, I'm I'm using the present tense uh, in in a sense to undermine that that work that connects the artist to uh, his surrounding, her surrounding, and to 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 the community that uh, or the audience they they're they're hoping to to cater to, and uh, it's, it's proving to be a big challenge. So in order to connect all these kind of uh, um, scattered dots, I think uh, the whole idea, uh, the potential that lies uh, with the work that we do and uh, that uh, contemporary art provides is, is basically uh, the linkages and the connections that we are able to create amongst ourselves as institutions working in the field, uh, again, beyond our uh, uh, political geographies, uh, uh, reaching out to a much farther audience, uh, learning from each other, and basically providing alternatives uh, to, uh, to artists and to practitioners uh, beyond what is uh, basically provided to them on a silver plate from either the authorities on one hand or the art market on the other hand that of course have have their own uh, agendas so uh, I myself having had uh, the the privilege to work in two different and quite contradictory situations on one hand the Palestinian condition where uh, where the, the, I mean, there's this um, a, there's a completely closed off horizon, be that on the uh, political uh, resolution of the conflict, on the uh, on the um, um, economic situation, uh, a complete fragmentation of society and geography itself, and working in a completely different uh, environment where when I went to the Gulf where there's abundance, affluence, a lot of money, but yet uh, one looks beyond that surface, you see that there's absolutely no infrastructure for the arts. And, and the artists themselves who are practicing, uh, practicing there are completely dependent on the government. And they have uh, not even thought about creating systems that would help them, uh, you know, uh, produce work that is not linked or related to the agendas of their governments. Yeah. So, uh, so um, the, the my point here, I mean, just to kind of sum sum up uh, what I'm trying to say is that what uh, what this thing is trying to do is bring these connections. Through within a, a certain area to a, I mean, a much larger audience and a much more larger uh, um, network of organizations and institutions that hopefully would provide alternatives and potentials for, for practitioners uh, that otherwise in some areas are, are completely non-existent. Thank you. What I'm going to do is uh, talk about one crucial point that I see as fundamental in the shift, and that is the transformation of capacity. What are the terms in which this transformation of capacity has occurred? And I'm actually going to argue very briefly that there has been a very significant transformation of capacity. Uh, I think a year and a half ago, uh, there's, there's an essay in uh, Eflux by Kwatemuk Medina, where he says, the debate on contemporary art has shifted with the eruption of the South, what he called the South in contemporary art. Now, if we filter this through the Asian context, whatever that might be, right, we have to open up precisely these two elements, Asia and, uh, and the idea of the multitude. Now, 
for me, what is most interesting in this transformation of capacity is the last 10 years, uh, the coming of new media in the broadest sense. Before new media, as I'm going 10, 12 years ago, small micro infrastructures coming up. Before that, you had pretty much what uh, Rancière would call a police function of cultural theory. Uh, this police function meant putting things in place, state-centered cultural elites would patronize who became an artist, would filter connections to the international world, would produce this whole model of the local through all the kind of institutions that we are familiar with. What is so remarkable, not just in China, not just in India, but in so many other parts of the world, and Jack has talked about it, is in the last decade we see a whole new landscape of art production that has emerged and we want to consider when we think about this why is this potential occurred when institutions at least in my country are extremely fragile so you have to produce in a sense the context of your own thought and your own practice this for me is precisely what you know so when, when we started doing this in India much later we read Rancière, The Emancipated Spectator, when he talks of this new sensorium, right? This is precisely the shift, it's a very important shift, where there's a new transformation of potentiality and capacity, capacity to set up context, where the stakes are actually much lower, but actually far more interesting, in a way. So, we need to think about scale when we talk about potential, we need, need to think of the terms of collaboration, but it's a very important and radical moment which could obviously be captured by the market. But I think the terms in which we enter that space are quite crucial. And so this is the point I want to place. The terms of, the term, the transformation of capacity, the form of collaboration, and revisiting Asia really. Because Asia in this last decade of new media has been completely globalized in a way that it never was since the 16th century. So this, these are these three elements I want to lay before you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm perhaps going to touch a little bit more specifically on a part of our programming at SALT. Uh, the topic of this panel made me think further about uh, two exhibitions we've recently been working on. Um, the first is closed and the other is about to open. So these two exhibitions in some ways couldn't appear more different, but I think in terms of this conversation about relevance and uh, cross-collaboration in Asia, they suddenly come together for me in a new way. So the first is a title Scared of Murals, and it ran from January and closed about a week ago. Um, it was one in a loose series of exhibitions organised by SART that interrogates particular recent moments in Turkish history. Um, and this lack of historicisation that Stenka touched on is something very relevant to us at the moment in Turkey. Um, so we've been looking at the effects of westernisation and the civilization project of the Turkish Republic uh, in order to both understand better these historical moments and question the effects of former events and their heritage on current cultural thinking. This exhibition, uh, Scared of Murals, focused on a more recent moment of cultural production that antedates September the 12th, 1980, the third and last coup d'etat carried out by the Turkish army. The coup, the third in three decades, ruled the country for three years. Scared of Murals documented the position of artists during the period between 1976 and 1980. The research in the exhibition revived the period by tracing exhibitions, public art projects such as murals, collective and political endeavours, they revolved around the Visual Arts Association of the time. It looked at artists' rights, the relationship between art and society as well as economy, labour and politics, debates and censorship, and the cultural policies of the state. Um, and actually, Hazabuzu's performance last night kind of fits into this trajectory a little. Uh, their, their play with language in some ways refers to the shift from the Ottoman to the Latin alphabet that was implemented by the Republic in 1920s Turkey. So within this framework, the exhibition's aim was not to identify and stabilise this moment closed in on its own history, but to investigate what can be excavated and reinvigorated in the hope of presenting possibilities that exist outside of the hegemonic marketization of the art world that marks our current time. 
The exhibition about to open next week is Taiping Tianguo, which is curated by, uh, sorry, curated by Cosmin Costinas and Doyun Chong. And it was originally exhibited at Parasite in Hong Kong, where some of you might have seen it. Taiping Tianguo attempts to think of actual and concrete, as well as tenuous or even possibly non-existing connections between four artists of Chinese heritage, Ai Weiwei, Frog King Kwok, Du Ching She, and Martin Wong, who lived and worked in New York during the heady days of the 1980s and early 1990s. The landscape of New York during that period was welcoming a diaspora of creative people, while at the same time experiencing the critical early years of the AIDS pandemic. Um, and as we all know, throughout the 20th century, artists from across Asia um, and of course from Turkey traveled to cities in Western Europe and the United States to experience stimulating artistic communities and often a more liberal lifestyle than the one they were encountering at home. But now as new cultural hubs are established in East and South, we're in a position to review how these moments impacted individual practices uh, and the development of relative art discourses in different countries. While Taiping Tianguo looks specifically at four Chinese artists forging their artistic positions while in New York, the relationships they formed present just one set of possible encounters that can be multiplied, as in terms of the multitude, to imagine similar but very place-specific scenarios occurring across the globe. Um, so I was thinking that these similarities that appear between the forming of creative relationships in these two exhibitions, the cultural activities that were being generated they referred to interferences by the state and other authoritarian bodies that were being experienced in the last century across much of Asia. Um, the exploration of artists that were experiencing other art contexts and informal networks, the informal networks they created, um, and the moments of crisis that are cited by these two exhibitions, while looking at very different contexts, speak of the potential similarities experienced across the globe during related time frames. Um, and it was interesting, well, while we had the exhibition uh, Scared of Murals on show, which was almost entirely presented in Turkish, even artists that were travelling to Turkey at the time who perhaps couldn't understand a lot of the content commented on how interesting it would be to broaden the horizon of this exhibition and the research undertaken to perhaps incorporate parallel stories occurring in other geographies, and those specifically mentioned were Korea and, of course, the Middle East. Such a suggestion hints that there is a possibility to explore comparable pasts and to investigate a shared cultural heritage by assembling what can become cross-referential investigations into models of practice and cultural development. Thank you. I think uh, <clears throat> one way to respond to the issues pre uh, presented to us in this panel, in this panel is to uh, briefly uh, talk about two projects that I have been uh, involved in. And the first project is uh, the project of uh, the Clark Institute in Massachusetts. And uh, this is part of the Trade Roots of Art History project. And uh, I recently convened in Manila uh, on behalf of the Clark Institute, uh, the conference, the, history, the histories of art history. In, in Southeast Asia. So the other project that I'm involved in um, and also uh, related to Southeast Asia is the Guggenheim uh, project for Southeast Asia. And this uh, resulted in an exhibition of Southeast Asian contemporary art at the Guggenheim in, in New York. So uh, I, mention, I mention these two institutions because they are very important institutions uh, in terms of of the discipline of uh, art history in the West, as well as the formation of, of contemporary art in, on the global scale uh, yeah, with regard to, to the Guggenheim. Uh, in the first project in the history of art history in Southeast Asia, the, the question was the history of art. So what does it mean to write the history of art in Southeast Asia? And for the second project, it was, the focus was art in the present. So how does one describe art in the present in Southeast Asia? So uh, in terms of, uh, with regard to the theme of relevance as contemplated in the panel, I see a, a quite a significant shift from the first to the second. In the first, it is the time of the art that is discussed or questioned. Uh, in the second project, it is the art of the time. 
So, uh, I, I, I mentioned this as well in relation to uh, what Sedenka has, uh, has touched upon and that has something to do with delay and belatedness. So I think we can see this delay and belatedness from the, well, on the part of the West. I think it is the West that has been delayed, uh, that is finally catching up with, with Southeast Asia uh, in the way they're trying to rethink <coughs> the very foundations of the discipline of, of art history and also in terms of conceptualizing the contemporary in, in our time. I, I mentioned these two projects in light of um, my involvement with uh, the National Art Gallery in Singapore, which has the biggest collection of Southeast Asian art in, in the world. So we, in our meetings in, in the gallery, we, we ask, what does, it, what does it mean? What does it mean to build or open a, a modern, a museum of modern art in Southeast Asia at this time? Will the material or the object in the museum if we have to persist with the term museum, still be described as art? And in what sense? Or will it be about visual culture? So these are, this is a continuing discussion in, in, in the museum in, in Singapore. So, uh, so I think this is uh, initially uh, what I'd like to bring to, to the table, these two important projects from the Guggenheim, the Clark Institute, also in light of the initiative from Southeast Asia itself, which is to open a museum of essentially modern art uh, in, in Singapore. And I'd like to maybe end with uh, the proposition that for me, uh, Southeast Asia is, is a region, and it is a region of the possible. But in thinking about it as a region, I ask myself, uh, three questions which uh, I don't have uh, smart, smart answers to, and this, these are, what is Southeast Asia if it is not a region, and what is a region if it is not a locality of countries, and what is a country if it is not a nation? So, the three questions. Uh, what is Southeast Asia if it is not a region? What is a region if it is not a locality of countries? What is a country if it is not a nation? Thank you. So I'm just going to check the time to see. OK, we have about. 20 minutes for discussion and I think it would be great to start with discussion. I'm going to try and kind of summarize and we can start maybe bringing out some points that you listening to each other are interested in and how they kind of add to the way that you're thinking. Um, but I would love it if people start thinking of the questions or the comments that you want to make from the audience. So as soon as you have as soon as you've formulated something, like, let me know. I'll keep looking out there, and then I'll integrate your, your questions and your comments into the, um, the dealings. So I'm just going to try and kind of pull together some of, the, uh, some of the points that the panelists made so that we've at least got a bit of everything on the table. What's interesting is that this, this question of relevance seems to go backwards and forwards in terms of creating context. Because on the one hand, we've got a number of you that are talking about the, um, the, the need to produce some kind of historicization or to um, kind of be able to create a context by creating some kind of foundation through it, the fact that there is a history. On the other hand, um, Ravi kind of led the way, and then I think other people have agreed, um, particularly Jack, um, that it's about, it's about actually kind of looking forward and questioning all these terms anyway. So if, if Asia isn't Asia anymore, if um, local contexts 
are no longer kind of produced in the same way through um, institutions. Um, Ravi was suggesting that new media, for example, could be creating a different kind of potentiality. And we could be talking about relevance in a completely different way if we think about looking forward rather than looking backwards. And I think, um, Patrick, what you said, it's like, it's kind of the difference between the time of the art and the art of the time. And I don't know if this is a, if we have to have an either or, but we certainly have two poles that we're looking at here in terms of relevance. Just maybe two other points that came up. This, this notion of timeliness, because it could be that actually both are incredibly timely right now. So what is timeliness in relation to relevance and potentiality? And um, also this question of institutions in relation to art practice. Jack was talking about the fact that institutions are kind of a way to amplify the way that artists are thinking and um, trying to produce something. Um, Zdenko was kind of asking the question of whether institutions should be universalizing or relevant to the local and focusing on the local. And then Patrick, you also kind of talk, talked about that in terms of, you know, is it now, what is it to create a kind of museum of modern art retroactively, if you like, when it's already been there? So I'll leave, I'll leave those kind of um, issues on the table, and I wonder if anybody's got any comments. Is, is there something about this kind of historicization and if you like, kind of the moving forward? I wanted to sort of uh, reconnect some of the you know, points. I think for, for, for me, the way I see it, uh, you know, delay, the idea of delay is, is very interesting. Delay, history, delay and history, connecting up the two, is very interesting because it's a, it's a kind of trauma, trauma, I think, that most non-Western societies, quote unquote, went, were forced to go through elites, traumatized about it, we have to catch up, you know, with an art, this is a big debate, you know, how do we deal with modernism, and I think uh, there are different pathways to, de to dealing with delay, right? And, and the way I see it, uh, you know, the, the question that we have to ask is, is there a link between uh, the, you know, the state, state, the state, nationalism, and, and, and the idea of catching up and, and delay, uh, or do we actually, where institutions are fragile, do we also open up thinking about creating new contexts? So new media for me is not a technological shift, it's a kind of allegory for, for, for a moment, you know, <coughs> different contexts and different micro infrastructures that are possible. So, you know, where contexts are really difficult. And, and these are these are things that I, you know because delay has has been a for me is, is a great anxiety that the past part of thirty years this is, this is one thing I keep thinking about. Yeah. I, I think related to the uh, delay, the the question of um, catching up, you know, the, the something that is final that uh, we need to reach uh, is uh, like uh, uh, necessary. I think we have to stop this logic. Probably this is the modernist logic, the logic of the progress, you know, that this is a final uh, history model, final institutional model that we need to reach. And that, that's why I think this discussion of potentiality of becoming is crucial, you know, uh, f especially for our regions. Uh, so Patrick mentioned the, uh, the, the question of your museum of modern art, or should it be the museum? Should it be called a museum at all? I think the, the questions of terminology uh, are also important. You know, we are still uh, very much caught in this uh, Western epistemological uh, frame. So we can't rid of it. So we need really to relax and to start thinking about time differently. I think this is the time is really a crucial category of discussion today. So is, is context and relevance like connected to the point? It's like, is, is it only possible to have relevance with context? That's what I'm wondering, because it seems to be interconnected the whole time with the way that everybody's kind of talking, that's like, it's understanding the context, 
produces, like, or helps us understand how to make something relevant. Is that? Context in the sense of needs and requirements. Context in the, in the sense of how you can service uh, society and uh, basically uh, uh, live, live up to your mission and the goals that you set for yourself. Uh, be that uh, as individual practitioners or institutions. And uh, uh, referring back to the, uh, the idea of the fragility of the institutions, uh, at least the grassroots institutions, uh, my point is that uh, in, in a time of crisis, such as, uh, I mean, in several, not everywhere in the world, but in many places in the world, um, uh, there needs to be this, these linkages and, uh, uh, and uh, connections and collaborations uh, that basically works on the potential and uh, um, creates uh, a, a sum that is greater than the uh, the number of, yeah, of the parts. It's an interesting question, what is context, you know, for me context is, uh, doesn't exist unless uh, it, it has been, been um, articulated. So the question of relevance is strongly related to the issue of context. Relevant to the context of China also, like it's, there is infrastructure that seems to be there. When you were talking about the Gulf, there is a very visible and a very physical manifest infrastructure. But it's apparently not the infrastructure we want or need. I think it's maybe very relevant in China to, to think about what, what is the types of infra infrastructures that we would need. Um, instead of like uh, looking at all these boxes, you know, or that you see in the Gulf, that you see in China, that you see uh, at other places, uh, that kind of like make this look of infrastructure being there. There is, there, is a, there is an infrastructure, but we can't use it, or we, it's not what we need. So what is the, the relevant infrastructure, in a sense? What is the infrastructure we want to aim at? Um, and something maybe already advancing on the discussion of late afternoon, but it's, I think that's quite important. I've tried to think about the structure as, uh, as, a, as a whole ecology, uh, as a, a kind of a, a circular form uh, that basically connects these different uh, components. Uh, yes, it is true, and that's what bothered me in the Gulf, is that their idea of infrastructure was very linear in the sense let's build a building, and then we figure out what we put in it, and that would be the the institution that will service art. And I was trying to always say that uh, you're completely missing the point. Infrastructure is a whole chain of, 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 um, uh, of uh, activities and people and connections and uh, potentialities that come together to, f to form uh, the basis for uh, uh, any any art um, uh, uh, any art movement to thrive on. So my, my what I was saying is that if you're thinking about the artist as can I say the beginning of of, of the whole idea of uh, the whole um, uh, uh, the whole process of producing art, and then to to service the artist you uh, you need for example. The institution or the uh, center, like here, or a museum or a gallery space, but then that that uh, that museum or that center would need also the professional to service it. So you'd need the curator and you'd need the, the technicians and uh, um, and all the support services that come with it. Uh, but those would also uh, need the education uh, system that basically provide these professionals and train them. And <clears throat> also to, to service those, you would need uh, the uh, uh, communication system. So you'd need the magazines and the papers and the critics and the, and the people who would basically talk about the art that is produced by the artist that is exhibited at the gallery, that is curated by the curator, etc. 
and uh, and then to kind of make that make sense financially, you would need the uh, uh, the market. You would need the gallery to sell it and distribute it, distribute it, this this artwork so that you know the artist can live off his work, her work, etc. But those are not living uh, in 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 thin air. They need the uh, um, uh, the collectors, the collectors who, who would buy from the galleries, who would service these, and and you see, it's a chain. And and so when I was trying to propagate the idea of infrastructure, I was always telling these because I was linked to the government. I was trying to tell the government, you're completely missing the point by building these museums. You need to basically provide for all these different components that make up the chain and the ecology that would help produce a, a meaningful, thriving art, uh, um, yeah, art uh, economy. Uh, I think this is uh, very well uh, explained, uh, and I totally agree. I would say that, you know, normally if you think infrastructure is about the building technology and so on, it's about knowledge production and it's about the history. So the history making is one of the crucial points of infrastructure. If you don't have historical narratives in certain space, it doesn't matter if you have big museums or whatever, you know, a lot of money, but it doesn't mean anything. You can't move anywhere without it. And I think the question of infrastructure is actually the question of art system, which includes everything that you mentioned, plus uh, the history. Just maybe to Ravi or Jack, in the idea of potentiality, it looks like, sorry, hello. Yeah. It looks like there is an idea of good, in a sense that something good or beautiful or something very assertable will come out. There could be a sense of threat. Potential, actually, I think, as potentiality or imminent, there is a deep sense of threat, and that's why a certain way in which the art historical is produced can no longer be narrated. One of the reason is it produces a threat. And this and museums and art infrastructure sometimes are unable to even recognize the threat or act as if it's not there. And one of the main intellect like one of the main delay in places in Asia, and I think it's the biggest delay, a big difference from European institutions, is an internal delay. Internal, I'll give an example. Uh, European institution and artist emerges. Can you speak closer to the Hello, artist emerges. They have a the delay between discourse and their visibility and legibility is very sharp, very fast. Mm -hmm. A lot of my friends have seen it with happen in six months. That's, uh, in Manifesto, there was a work we did, uh, some artist did. Within six months, he was in Venice Biennale with a book out, with 10 people writing curatorial and very, very, very good essays around it. And in Asia, to produce that, you will need 15 years. And and, and and this is one of and this is the, and this is this is the fundamental intellectual delay is this and that's why I'm saying because the perception of threat is higher here. You don't know if you validate it what will come out of it institutionally, intellectually. And it, I see it in art history departments where I, where we have taught us. It, there's a complete confusion as to what will you validate. Will it be threatening to to power elites to to international markets, it may fall off the radar. So that sense of turbulence in the potential is much higher here than in European institutionally managed artists. It's, it's like an arranged marriage in Europe. In India, it is the runaways, you know, like we're all running away to find people and you don't know whether you will even have a legitimate form of marriage or not. So is that relationship, I'm just wondering, because this, this internal delay and this turbulence changes the terms that you produce intellectually for a discourse around institutions and artistic practice and context. Just curious about how you read this. <laughs> this is like a Asian dialogue. But I think I think uh, the notion of the potential, you know, uh, as the good, of course, is is philosophically problematic. You know, you know, it's I think it's philosophically problematic. It it can't it can't be the good. You know, it, it, you know it, it, it's a new opening, and there will be different. You know, I think a different plateau 
of conflict that is opening up precisely because of these new new infrastructures that develop. I think it's 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 a, it's, it's a language we haven't developed yet for this new zone. We, because we had the state in the market, and we had the grand old pillars of history, nation, you know, whatever, you know. And, and then you have had the last decade where Asia has really been churned upside down, and and the differences in Asia have shown up. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example. In a recent presentation that I did, in a public lecture that I did, I used, uh, I was telling Jack, you know, this Lebanese artist, Rabi Broy, Broy's, uh, you know, work with, with, the, with the cell phone, because I mean, you know, I'm, I'm doing something on cell phone, you know, cell phone photography. And these are interesting connections that, that are, have, that, that, that I think these new infrastructural, pos these are the potentials. The, the capacity to make connections and the capacity, and the understanding that there will be constant new contradictions and in which the state is not the only player. And that I think is a real opening, but it's also I think sharp, different cities of sharp, thing, sharp so situations we don't know about. response from the Chinese context. Uh, I will comment on the uh, word uh, relevance. Uh, because I, uh, I learned in you know, my very early age that uh, uh, for an artist to be uh, ele relevant, uh, he or she has to serve the people. So uh, that's the word for the model zone. So uh, uh, now as an artist, uh, uh, I try to be on with it. Because that's not uh, politically correct in contemporary China. So uh, what can they do? Uh, so in my experience, I think they are, they are trying to uh, play games with all these terms, like people, uh, workers, uh, migrant workers, all these things. So uh, uh, I think that they have uh, big problems with all that, because they want to do uh, very um, individualistic things, but uh, they also want to be relevant. So uh, it's, uh, to me, very contradictory. So. Uh, uh, in my discussions with them, I found that uh, what they are trying to do is to uh, cut the Chinese reality into fragments. So uh, that's uh, better to uh, deal with it. I think they are... Uh, Can you talk to the mic? They are just not uncomfortable with the re reality itself and all these terms. So uh, I think the, uh, uh, the big task in the Chinese contemporary uh, art is to uh, make the artists uh, know that they are trying to, uh, like to uh, ignore the uh, big political uh, subject and then to serve very small uh, subjects, possibly absent subjects. So uh, officially we have um, two, uh, 260 million of migrant workers, but I think there is no, uh, no single one uh, work of art for them. So uh, they are absent. So I think the, uh, uh, the most uh, uh, contemporary Chinese uh, artists can do is to fictionalize the Chinese reality so that they, uh, he can handle it. <laughs> I think that's the uh, uh, from my um, in response to uh, uh, Mr. Lu Xinhua, um, recently about migrant workers, recently I was on a uh, panel of judges uh, for a young curator's uh, selection for a grant, and one of the young curators was working for the newly established China Migrants Workers Museum. And they're commissioning um, many Chinese very famous artists like Liu Xiaodong and uh, Xiao Liu Wei and, uh, and many other artists of like Jan Wang and so on, to, and Zhang Dali, um, making works that are about or respond to the migrant workers' situation. It's a huge, gigantic building, all about the subject of migrant workers, um, but it's. <laughs> It's, you know, it was all put in this PR speak that made the whole thing seem almost totally contradictory to what migrant workers actually need. Um, but it's definitely what um, certain people need to be showing to that they show concern for migrant workers and their plight. So is, is this kind of problematic relevance or is the creating 
the PR of relevance, regardless of whether it's the government or whether it's artists themselves, that I think uh, Lucien Hua is talking about. So um, we need to wrap up this session, but I think that the last comments bring up something that is uh, really important to think about as we move into the next session. Because there is this question of relevance to who. You know, we can, we can all talk about our different perspectives and give concrete examples of you know, what, what we think relevance is, but the next, the next panel is going to challenge the relevance to whom by dealing with audiences. So I think we have 10 minutes break. So we will come back at 10, 11, 11.45. Thank you. And thank you very much to the uh, speaker panelists. Yeah.